We are delighted this morning to be joined by John Voss, History Pin Strategic Partnerships Director for London-based nonprofit We Are What We Do. In that capacity, John is helping to build an open ecosystem of historical data across libraries, archives, and museums worldwide. In his work at the inter intersection of history and technology, he's jump-starting important projects ranging from the development of institutional infrastructure, like linked open data, and game-changing conferences and working groups, to consumer-facing web and mobile products. He organized the first international linked open data in libraries, archives, and museums summit in 2011, as well as the Humanities and Technology Unconference that camp, Bay Area. He is the founder of Look Back Maps and project manager of Civil War Data 150, a collaborative project to share and connect Civil War related data across local, state, and federal institutions during the four year sesquicentennial of the American Civil War. Please join me in welcoming John Voss. Good morning. It's an honor to be here with you. I am uh, a huge fan of Archivist, and it's great to be on the inside and see the initiation ritual that happens uh, at the beginning, which is pretty fascinating. Uh, in fact, I'm the president of the California Archivist Fanboy Collective, and we decided this year to use Green Bay Packer memorabilia uh, to gather autographs and things like that. So you might see some of my fellows around the lobby looking for you when you come out. Just you know, be grac gracious with them. They can get a little bit excited. But I wasn't always a groupie, I have to say, uh, and a fanboy. I was skeptical at first uh, in 2008 when I first started working with archival photos, trying to do something which to me seemed pretty simple, putting historical photos on a map so that I could see the history of my neighborhood across archival collections. And when I first started talking to archivists, um, I was really amazed to find, you know, I said, you know, if, if I can do it, why aren't you doing it? You know, why isn't this happening already? Uh, so I was a little bit, you know, nervous about that and approaching them. And one of my first meetings was with Lori Lindbergh. And uh, she kind of talked me off the cliff there a little bit and said, John, calm down. We archive things so that people can find them. I mean, that's the whole point. And that was a really exciting turning moment for me, uh, working with people like Mark Harvey, the archivist of the state of Michigan, and others now around the world to find that there is this real interest of sharing and having a uh, collective experience across the libraries, archives, and museums, the DPLA, as you mentioned, just incredible developments. So Lori and I and a bunch of others back in 2009 started looking talking with technologists, talking with others, developers, how can we start to find solutions that will get us uh, to the next step? And we started talking about this idea of linked data. Remember when libraries, archives, and museums captured imaginations by connecting information and led the internet revolution? It's happening again. Aside from really cool hairdos back then, this was the library experience to me uh, as I entered college, 1991. And it was this radical idea of coming out of the card catalogs and interfacing with technology in a way that would help us find information. This is where the internet revolution began. It was in the libraries and in the archives. And the really important point for us you know, and for me, as a college student, 
was that not only could I find information, but very soon after I could start to find people and make connections. So we started by finding the books. We ended by finding the people. And if we think back a little bit to the evolution of the web, this is a great site called evolutionoftheweb.com. And you can see here in 1991, it's hard to see on this map, but that blue arrow, that very first blue arrow, is the HTTP protocol, right? This hypertext protocol. That you could start to do this crazy thing of linking one document to another. That was all it was. That's how the World Wide Web began. And you know, thinking about this beyond borders idea and this theme, I started to think about what else was going on in the world then. And you might look in 1989, 1990, you had Nelson Mandela being freed, the fall of apartheid, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall, you had perestroika happening. I mean, so much exciting things in the world. This, and it's not a coincidence, I don't think, that out of that context, that global context, came this desire to connect with one another in new ways. That was how the World Wide Web started. That's what it was about. And then as time went on, you could see all the different technologies that would flow into this, and it doesn't all fit on the screen, but it brings us up to the current day where we have so many things. You use the web, we take it for granted. But it began with that very first notion of connecting one another with documents and then connecting to the people behind those documents. So today I want to talk about linked open data in libraries, archives, and museums and talk to you a little bit about what it is. Um, not too much. We'll dig into the, the law, the technology, um, and the culture that makes this possible. And it's this culture that's very much uh, a part of what we're talking about when we bridge libraries, archives, and museums. It's radically open cultural heritage data on the web. So this is a visualization of a track. And it's really, to me, embodies the idea of mashup culture. Right? Wake you up. What happens when we take music, movies, everything from across generations, and we mix it together? So here you have Belinda Carlisle from the 80s. You've got Afro Rican providing the beat. If anyone recognizes that, a little Layla to get it going. You put it together to create one experience. And it's a really exciting environment to be within. I mean, this is mashup culture. That's how I live as somebody who grew up on the web. That's what I expect of my information these days. This, these kind of images you know, are either your worst nightmare or a dream come true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking to the dreamers, I think, because this is a dream to me. The DJ in the archives and you know, what we can start to do with that. But we're not that far from this, I think. I mean, if you look, this is a, a great example here of, of uh, 2010, the National Archives did a, a postcard contest, photo contest. And they asked people, they said, look, our content is open. It's free for you to use. And we want you to take it and put it in place and uh, see what you can do with it. And I submitted uh, using some technology, which would then become part of History Pin, uh, an app that would take you to a place and overlay a photo. So here's a gate in uh, San Francisco, Japantown. And when you overlay a Dorothy Lange photo, all of a sudden you see the import of that location and what lies behind those places. And here, this photo is heads of households after uh, Pearl Harbor having to check in in what would become the beginning of their four years or so in concentration camps around the United States. But I'm not alone in doing that. So that was a great project. But we're seeing other people start to take content and do other things with them, mash them up. Take uh, Swedish artist Santa Dolloway and taking old photos and colorizing them. It's a very simple thing. It's a mashup, but it changes your experience of it. Or this photo here, which the Bikini Atoll. But when you colorize that, all of a sudden, that horrible moment seems so much more real. Well, it's not all so heavy. There's also enthusiasts who are doing things like uh, Burrito Justice in San Francisco, who wanted to take this old ballpark, which is no longer there, uh, in the mission, and put it back on the map. So they used old photos, Sanborn maps, and went into Safeway and Office Depot, where that stadium is now, and put the bases on the floor, actually. <laughs> or 
Or we take oldsf.org, another great place. We have so many techno- technologists and enthusiasts there and history buffs as well, right? So oldsf.org is a project by a developer who uh, was living in the mission in San Francisco and found a photo of his, his house in, on uh, San Francisco Public Library. Really wanted to see it on a map. He couldn't do it that way, so he screen scraped the entire site and took uh, 10,000 of the 40,000 photos and was able to make pins of them on the map create this experience. And he came to me after we launched History Pin. He said, hey, I made this thing. I want to I launch. I'm like, wait a minute. We should probably talk to the library first. Just see what they say. I think they'll be into it. And they were, actually. You know? So they, they were really excited about this project. But that's the, the point here is that people want access to this content, and they can do things with it. Here's another one that just came out, PassMapper. And we could go on and on. You know, this is a guy who took all the data from 1960s lounges around San Francisco and built an app that you can now check into those lounges. You know, so you're going in. This is uh, the golden pheasant as seen in uh, uh, Bullet, right? So let's spend a minute talking about the technology behind this idea of linked open data. So there's linked data and there's open data. They're capitalized because there are specific protocols behind them. And... uh, so linked data gives us the ability to start to move beyond tables. This is how we're dealing with information now. And the computing power, the experience of the World Wide Web has taken us to a point where this can really not scale anymore, where tables cannot scale anymore. So we're moving to a graph. We're going from tables to graphs. This is an example of a Twitter network, for instance, at, a, at an on-conference, how people were connected. And you start to see the importance of nodes and links. It's a really simple idea, and that's what it revolves around, that every piece of information is a node, and the way it relates to another piece of information is the link. And as that computing power increases, we're able to visualize things in new ways. So we might see a graph with this indication of a small Twitter network. The machine will see it represented on the right in a table, you know, and, and see it interpreted that way. So the key to linked data is triples. That's the concept. Uh, and it's subject, predicate, object. Uh, nodes and links. So we're going to keep with this Twitter example just to make it simple. So for instance, I follow Archives Next. I mean, who doesn't? You know, Subject, predicate, object. Me follows Archives Next. Right? Now this gives us the ability to take any piece of information and make it available on the web in a way that machines can read it. So we take it a little bit further, look at Ed Summers, the Library of Congress. It's always a willful guinea pig. What do we know about Ed? You know, we, we know that he, he knows Dan up on the right. So Ed knows Dan. Ed knows Jody on the bottom right. We know that we have photos of him on the web as well. And we know his bio, right? So these are the triples. His bio is hacker for libraries, digital archaeologist, pragmatist. We serialize that information in a number of ways. RDF is one of the main acronyms you want to know, Resource Description Framework. But basically, that means how we break down those triples into statements that machines can read, all right? The subject, predicate, object. And you can have a lot of variations of that. The technology is still evolving. We're very early in this, in this world of linked data, in this new web, right? But when we break it down this way, we create simple rules and protocols. We can start to dig into it. So we've almost translated our information to a way that the machines can talk to us and we can talk to them. Now it's a little early in the morning, but I'm going to show you some code. It's not that threatening, actually. You understand the idea of triples now, right? The subject, predicate, object. And Behind the web, when you look behind how things work, when we, when we see how, you know, these great visualizations that we see on the web, behind it is the information and how that's laid out. And if you're familiar with XML, this is an RDF XML sheet. And basically the top line, I'm sure you can't read this, but the top line tells us that this is an RDF sheet. Everything after that is going to be a representation of those triples, right? So in this case, everything here is about Ed Summers. And as you go down that list, you'll see that we've got his first name, his last name, his surname, a bunch of information. We've got his email here. Now, this is an RDF page that Ed Summers made. This is all the kind of information that he gives us about the web, his Twitter account, his Flickr account, his email address. You know, it's kind of scary how much information he's giving us on the web. But 
It's out there. And he's put it out there in a way that machines can find it and build this graph of knowledge. So if we know that his Twitter account is this, now we can go out and find his friends. We can use the, the grow that, that web, go a little bit further and get more information. All right? That's all it is. It becomes a little bit more complicated as we implement it, but those are the basic ideas of linked data. All right? What happens if we apply this to the humanities? And that's really what the Civil War Data 150 project has been about, a very early prototype of considering a graph of information when you take it beyond just people or places. But what if we started to map the Civil War? And so in this graph at the top, you can sort of see the example of the 1st Michigan Colored Regiment. You know, this is a state historical marker. So we have all the information about where the historical markers are. We also have the regimental flags around the world and different, around the country in different ways. We have maps of the battles that they participated to the right. We know the generals who commanded that. And you can start to pull together the photos of those people, the information about those people, the monuments. Uh, you know, you can go back the other way to the left and see, you know, one of the particular soldiers who served and then find his pension records, his death records. Those all exist. The maps of the state that he lived in, et cetera. And it builds a very you know, compelling view of the war and of the information related to it. So here it all revolves around the simple connections of regiments, battles, and places. So if we can link things to those three concepts, we can really build interesting visualizations. Well, here's an example, conflict history. This is not just related to the Civil War. It actually shows all of the conflicts of humankind that have been recorded in Wikipedia. And it turns out that there have been a lot of conflicts in humankind. And this is just the, you know, the ones that existed in the United States between uh, 1861 and 1865. Uh, here, this map, because we have that information in Wikipedia, it's structured data. We can make it available. You can also look on the map and find the battle, zoom in on them. Right? see a little bit more information. And here this is feeding on Wikipedia, it's feeding on Freebase. You can go down into the battle level, the Battle of Iuka, and you'll notice that it's automatically pulling a map of that battle, right? Because we know that they're related across those different triples or pieces of information. Then you can relate this to the books as well. So this is an example on, on uh, the Open Library Project uh, at Internet Archive, and here's one of probably 600 or so regimental histories that they have. And the Open Library already has, you know, they're creating a page for every book. Behind that code, as we showed you, is an RDF page as well. And this is early RDF, but this tells us that everything about that book can be related to the Library of Congress subject headings, for instance. Um, we can look and see what, you know, follow those links along. Now in this, in this, in, in see, this instance of it, they haven't all been linked together yet, so we're still getting there. I want to make clear that this is a work in progress. We're building this together right now. Right? And then start to feed in other layers of that. Here's the Visualizing Emancipation Project out of University of Richmond. And uh, they take that, the regimental histories, the regimental um, kind of positions, and start to add other information to that, connect to that. Uh, the story of emancipation and how that evolved and was it connected, asking humanities research questions of how that might be connected, right? So we continue, I mean, this is the answer to the so what of linked open data, you know, what, what's it good for? And I think for us, we're starting to explore at History Pin, which is my day job, you know, which was all really about building a better time machine and building community around history, um, where we've got you know, we just surpassed 400 institutions that are contributing data. History Penny, you know, people have their own channels, the National Archives, uh, University of Louisville, et cetera. You know, people are embedding these tools and creating things. It's not driven by linked data, but we're getting to the point of saying, what can we do if it is? How can that information be linked? Um, you know, and here's a visualization. By the way, I brought some stickers with me, so if you're one of the 400 on this list, and I know many of you are, um, you know, come and see me, we'll, we'll do some stickers. What happens when you start to visualize this information in a compelling interface? You know, here we are at the Coronado in San Diego, bringing this back to life, making that part of the mobile experience. So we're just starting to scratch the surface of how we can apply this linked data. Here's another example of a project we're working on with King's College in London with a GIST grant, um, where because we have the date and the place, we can dig a little bit deeper. 
And here we're experimenting using linked data to find out what other collections might be relevant to this date and place that you've just dropped into. You know, so you can go deeper and see, well, we've got a collection here at this university that may be relevant to what you're looking at and start to build better implementations. This is another great example of a PhD candidate in Australia. He's studying museum studies and computer science, which is an amazing combination. And what he's done here is he's used uh, a couple different algorithms and engines to visualize the Brooklyn Museum collections through their API. And he's also demonstrated that you can start to take multiple collections and bring them together. And here he wants to show you the experience of walking down a hallway and randomly finding information. Well, the metadata t actually tends to be linked together through common threads, right? So these are the kinds of things that we're starting to do because the technology is there and because the will is there to do it. So we can have linked data and we can have open data. You can have linked data without having open data and you have open data without linked data. The great thing is when you combine them. But as, as much as having the technology tools, we also have the legal tools that exist now that did not exist years ago. And I think within this community, as everything changes around us, as industries change, the music industry, the movies industry, the same with the libraries and archives industry, but this community is a community of innovators, not litigators. And we're really looking at how to empower and support this kind of behavior. All right? How do we bring these makers into it? So one of the things that we've looked at that's really important, it's kind of technical, but separating the metadata versus the data and the assets themselves. You know, so you've got a license on this, how you can use this. This is Library of Congress, so we know it's public domain. But you may have another collection that has restrictions. But the metadata is something else. You know, you can give that another license. And as developers, technologists, can actually do quite a bit with that metadata if it's put out there in an open way. So here's some legal tools that we're looking at. The Creative Commons, right? So you've seen these probably. Everyone's familiar with Creative Commons, I hope. But putting licenses on images or on metadata that we can easily understand and say, this is what you've got. This is how we can use it. So CC BY, CC0 the public domain mark, these are all open licenses. And I always say open-ish is CC by SA, right, to put a share alike. But each of these licenses give us a clear indication of how we can use it. Do we need to give attribution? How do we give that attribution? Uh, and feed this into the web of data, all right? Now, you can also use Creative Commons licenses to publish data that aren't open, and there's a whole series of them. You know, these acronyms are, you know, NC is non-commercial, ND is no derivatives, and you can stack those up and interchange them. But it gives us the ability to access things in new ways. So culture, technology, law, these are the environments in which this is starting to evolve. And it sounds a lot like a dream. It sounds crazy, I know, but it's not. If you look at a web search on Google today, type in U2, for instance, you'll notice, and you've, we've started to see this over the last few months, few weeks, with the knowledge graph, that they're pulling data about U2, the band U2, from Wikipedia, from music databases, and starting to display that into your search. That's linked data. It's happening behind the scenes. And the question is whether or not we're going to play a part of that community. We need your expertise to add to this. You've been dealing with structured data for hundreds of years. Developers are going to make it accessible. We're going to build the technology for this. But it's really about sharing the stories and sharing the data. It's not about Google. The World Wide Web is so much bigger than Google. And we have to remember that and how we share those stories. If it's appealing to you, you're not alone. There's an entire community around the world that's in getting involved in this. In 2010, for instance, at that time, the British Library, Stanford University, University of Michigan, several others were already involved in this. We had some of the building blocks of those links, the vocabulary, uh, the VF files, the id.loc.gov. These are the subject headings of the Library of Congress that we can start to build the connections. Those were in place in, two, in 2010. And I don't know if you remember when we could map the internet. You could look at the World Wide Web on a map, right? This is the linked open data graph, or the linked data graph. And 
In 2010, this is what it looked like. In that year alone, that linked data cloud grew by 300%, all right? Like the web, it's growing exponentially. But the information specific to libraries grew by 1,000%, all right? So there's so much for this community to give to this. Just as David said, I mean, the, the importance of the underrepresented collections that exist. So in uh, last summer, we created the Linked Open Data Libraries, Archives, and Museum Summit. Uh, it was a really exciting get-together. We wanted to attract maybe 50 people, if we could, from around the world. We ended up with 100 that made it, and we had to put in extra tables. You know, we didn't have enough fried chicken and waffles, so we had to move to another restaurant as well. I mean, there just wasn't enough space. And loadlam.net is where you can find out more about this community and be a part of this community. Uh, it's growing around the world. You can see these meetups starting to happen in different places and see the connections that are starting to be made. You can follow Loadlam on Twitter. If you're a Twitter user, you'll see a lot of information that's coming out there as well. Things like Stanford's workshop, which uh, resulted in a technology plan that was published. Well, since then, 2011, you know, we started, I mentioned those British Library, the Open Library, others that existed. That ecosystem is growing ever quicker. You see the Smithsonian putting things up on GitHub, for instance. Uh, some of them are using open, open, you know, these are all public domain collections, metadata collections are going up. Some of them are linked data, and some of them are just open, right? But they're enabling us to work with it. Scientific data, the Harvard Libraries, University of Florida, the Nature Publishing Group, journals that are coming out that we can start to work with, and they use linked data. Uh, the Spanish and uh, German national libraries, all putting their information out there in open ways that we can start to build from and use. And finally, Europeana, which has 15 million records that are now available as open and linked data for us to utilize. And my question to you is simply, you know, who's got next? Start to add your collections to these, and there's ways to do it. You know, I'm, as Harvey Milk was, was fond of saying, I'm here to recruit you. You know, this is, I want, I want your data. I want to be able to use it, you know? And there are a lot of ways to get involved. It's not like this crazy technical thing. It's a community of users, right? So check out loadlam.net for one. Uh, follow that Twitter handle as I've shown you, loadlam. And then even here, right? Session 401 tomorrow. You've got a great group of thinkers in this space who are going to present. Um, so check your schedule on where that is. Um, session 401 tomorrow. But most of all, contribute. You know, think of how you can start to take your information, put it out there in ways that we can use it. Start small, but start. Start with maybe a Civil War collection or some one collection. Put it out there as a CSV file, you know, in a way that people can use. And you'll see a lot of information on how to do this. You know, these friendly Belgians are here to help you too. Using tools like Google Refine, which gives us the ability to actually work with metadata in ways that we've never had the opportunity to do before. You know, dig in. There's ways to get into this, right? I want to end with one more mashup. And this is a video that was put together from NASA archive images. You know, they take tens of thousands, millions of photos from the International Space Station. And enthusiasts have put them together into videos. Like these are just everyday people making something. All right? We don't know what people will do with our data. And we need to embrace that uncertainty. That is the culture and the community of the World Wide Web. It's not just something you go to view. It's something that we make together. And it sounds difficult. It sounds like a dream. But there are people living in space right now. 3,500 people worked hard for seven years to put a rover on Mars last week. It's hard, but we can do it if we have one goal. That is moving us beyond borders, as you say here. When you look from this view, the borders don't make a whole lot of sense. Not from our institutions, not from our countries, not from Berlin, from Mexico. And the web has made this a reality now more than ever. It was started as a way to connect to people. We need to fight to keep those connections free and open. It's not something that we could sit and let companies, corporations, countries lock up. 
So we've started with a web of documents. That's how the web started. We're moving to a web of data. This community, the library, the archive, the museum communities are going to play a key part of that, right? We're on this tiny little globe for just an instance. Just an instant. And we all know that better than anyone. You're preserving for future generations. And I think that we could do something great together. Thank you.